Okay, so just a reminder of what we were doing over the last few days. We were looking at uh, uh, systems subject to weak noise. Uh, specifically, the amplitude of the noise scales at, scaled as 1 over square root of n, where n is a large parameter. And, uh, and the motivation is a macroscopic system, which hopefully I'll get to discussing uh, tomorrow at least some results. And we're interested in calculating the rate function, which is the leading order in n, uh, describes the leading order of, in n of the probability of observing some uh, specific observable x. And specifically, uh, I was focusing on uh, steady state, uh, steady state distributions. Uh, and uh, I want to emphasize that you could also look at time averaged uh, quantities and then actually all the techniques that I'm teaching you now sort of mix with the uh, generating function uh, approach that I described at the, I think at the first day uh, of the lecture. Okay, so to keep things simple and focus on the general ideas and not technicalities, I was co considering one dimensional problems of the general form. Uh, of, uh, of this, a Langevin equation, where uh, this is Gaussian noise. And again, the square root of n is explicitly shown. And specifically, there are simple cases which you can solve, where uh, v of x is equal to minus mu kx, and uh, gamma of x is equal to gamma. This is an equilibrium problem, so you actually can solve it generally, and we'll probably uh, get to it uh, uh, later today. And, uh, and the idea, the, the approaches that I was describing was, were based on path integrals. So path integral representations of the transition probability. And specifically, we wrote the transition probability as a path integral from the initial position to final position at the given time. And the path integral over something that looks like the action of a, a, a classical uh, problem. So specifically for our case, the action was just this uh, expression. And again, it's nothing more than just a Gaussian uh, rewriting eta squared in a Gaussian distribution. And the, uh, the method that we described for uh, uh, calculating the probability of, uh, of uh, observing the system at state x uh, in the steady state was uh, to look at tf goes to infinity. And specifically, m most things that people do is a start at minus infinity uh, and integrate up to time 0. But it doesn't matter anything of what I'm doing. It's just notation. And then what you do is you minimize action. So you solve an euler lagrange problem, a classical uh, mechanics-like problem. And using this, you plug the solution in. In, and once you've done that, you have the cost, cost of reaching uh, uh, the final state x, and uh, and we identified uh, two sorts of trajectories. Uh, the first one was uphill, starting from the most probable state and reaching reaching some final rare configuration of the system. We call this an uphill configuration, and we also identified uh, downhill configurations where you start with x and go down, and uh, we derived explicitly equations for going down, but you can see that going down is not a problem. I don't have to use noise at all to go down uh, uh, the potential. There's no need to uh, exploit noise, which costs cost me, it comes with a cost of action. So the simplest thing to do is just to choose to go downhill. I can solve the equations. Uh, which were basically the action is zero, 
meaning just the noiseless equations. So for the case of the oscillator, I just slide down and this naturally gives me a zero action cost. So going up uh, costs action, going down doesn't cost action. And when we look at the trajectories of these guys, then of course the relaxation is dictated by a time scale given by one over mu k. And by time reversal symmetry, because this is an equilibrium problem, and I might be able to show it in generality depending on how much time I have, we can show that the equilibrium problems have time reversal symmetry, and therefore the uphill process is just the time reversed of the downhill. In some sense, you can think about uh, what makes equilibrium problems easy in terms of the large deviation. Well, solving the relaxation problem is a relatively easy pr problem compared to going uphill. And all you do is you solve this relaxation process, time reverse it, and you're done, you have your solution. And finally, in terms of wording, uh, because everything happens on this very, very short time scale compared, compared to the infinite uh, time scale that we're looking at, then we call it uh, an instant. So, so this path integral approach, it was a Lagrangian approach. And there's a corresponding uh, Hamiltonian approach, uh, which you, you can do, derive using what's called the melting Sija rose, rose method. And that gives you uh, that the transition probability now takes the form of, again, a path integral Uh, but now over two fields, one in auxiliary field, which uh, if we take the analog of, uh, uh, of mechanics is like a momentum, and we have a dt of x hat minus x dot, and something that we identify as a Hamiltonian of the system, and the Hamiltonian of the system, which again is a function of this position and momentum-like variable, is equal to, uh, can be written explicitly and takes this form, or for our oscillator problem, uh, it takes uh, this form. So questions so far about everything that I've done? Is the derivation of the uh, Martin Caesar Rose clear? If not, I could go through it a bit slower, but please let me know if there are uh, any questions. So for a time reverse path, uh does the action change sorry could you repeat the question uh, for the time reverse path does the, the, does the action change in which case uh in the in just the case above which you mentioned uh going uphill and going downhill uh so, so right the functional form of the action is exactly the same but going down i just use this downhill trajectory with zero cost but going up we did the calculation last time gives you a finite cost to the action and that gives you the just you know it's a harmonic problem so it gives kx squared with a mu and a gamma okay so going uphill costs because you're using you're going you're using the noise to climb up and going downhill doesn't cost anything uh, uh, I mean, physically, uh, I, I'm able to understand, uh, but uh, for, I mean, uh, when we do this time reversal, we do it on the equation of motion, right? Then the, right. the Lagrangian itself will change, right? When we do then for I equation, I mean, uh, for a time reversed uh, system, the Lagrangian will be uh, minus x dot plus mu x whole square. So, so when you do the, if I get to, hopefully I'll get to it later, but when you do the transfer, time reversal transformation on the Lagrangian directly, there is a boundary term which exactly gives you the potential difference, inequality. Okay. Okay, but I, I'm not sure that I'll get to it because we're a bit short and, in time. And uh, including that contribution, everything becomes zero for the reverse path. I mean, if you if we think, no, right? We want that the cost, the probability of finding the system, 
in this rare configuration is e to the minus the potential times beta. Yes. But finding it here is with probability, okay, to leading order one. Yes. Okay. So the large deviation function here and here are different. Okay. That's exactly the boundary term. Or by the method that I described. Fine. Okay? Yeah. Right now, I think it's simplest to think by the method that I described. We solve the uphill, we plug it back in, we get a cost, we put the downhill, and we get no cost. Okay, and we only saw that they're related by time reversal, really only by inspection. Mm -hmm. So in the same context, I have one question, like, can you go above? Yeah. So uh, you said like the action doesn't change for the forward part and the time reverse part. This x dot plus mu kx whole square, it remains intact for time reverse part also. Well, no, okay, I think I, I might have been unclear. This is the form of the action. When you solve it, you find out you can solve it, right? It's a second order differential equation, starting here and ending here, or starting here and ending here. And what we saw by inspection, that when we solved this history, it was exactly this, the time reversed of this history. Okay, we saw no, that I agree on. But, but I'm asking like, that I agree, but I'm asking like the form of the, uh, the transition probability that you have written, yeah. Uh, is that form going to uh, be different for the forward path and the time reverse path? The, the functional form written here? No, yes. it's exactly the same. Uh, how to see that for the time different. reverse path? Yeah, so I'm, right now, the, the way that I'm doing it at the moment, I, I, this is my transition probability between any two points. I could switch these two points. Right? At the moment, yeah. it's just written between these two points, but I could switch them and solve the problem. And I solve it honestly with doing a saddle point. So this problem, up to modifications of these boundary terms, is unmodified no matter with which trajectory you take. You're always using okay, the but... same equation. It's just okay. that the solutions are different. The going downhill, that you solve it so that this is zero. Going uphill, there's a finite cost. Okay. okay. Other questions? Uh, that explains my question also. Thanks. Okay. I'm happy. Other questions? Okay. If not, then I'll continue. So now we have a Hamiltonian problem. So there's to a solve Hamilton. Yeah. In chat, there's a question. Chat box. In the chat. Chat box. Downhill, whereas a. So, so in the comments, uh, there's a question that in equilibrium, the probability of going up should be equal to the probability of coming down as. Okay, so let me just uh, remind you that in equilibrium, a uh, detailed balance implied that the probability starting at configuration C and going to configuration C prime is equal to the probability of starting at configuration PC prime times CP prime to C. So the transition probabilities by no means should be equal. Okay, unless the energies are exactly equal. And if we have time, we're going to use it later. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so let me go on. We have our Hamiltonian formalism. And, uh, and again, if you don't like the Malkin Sijao's method, which is actually very useful, then uh, you can do it by a Legendre transform uh, where x hat, the momentum is given by a derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x dot, just the standard method. So could also use uh, 
this Legendre will transform directly to get to, to the Hamiltonian. And then we have our Hamiltonian equations of motion, x dot is equal to minus dh dx, and x dot is equal to dh dx hat, and exactly these describe the same dynamics uh, that we had uh, previously. Now, if we look at the, uh, at the expression for x hat, and I use uh, the Lagrangian that's sitting here, then you can verify that x hat, what is the direct analog of a momentum, is equal to one over two gamma times x dot plus mu kx, uh, which uh, in general, for the more general problem, is equal to x dot minus v of x divided by two gamma. Okay, so this you can get. This is, uh, this is our Lagrangian. And all I do is I differentiate it with respect to x dot. This gives me the momenta. And now we've identified the momentum uh, variable. And what I want to point out is that, uh, recall that we started with x dot is equal to v of x plus square root of two gamma over n times eta of t. So if I isolate eta of t, I get x dot minus v of x times square root of n over two gamma. And that means that uh, if I compare uh, this equation with this equation, it means that up to prefactors, so up to prefactors, x hat describes the most probable history of the noise. Okay, so that takes away uh, some of the mystery from this uh, variable x hat. Uh, specifically, if you want to make the relation explicit, then one over square root of two gamma n times eta is equal to x dot minus v of x divided by two gamma. Okay, there's also uh, in the Martin Caesar rose for a reason that I'll skip, many times this is called a response field uh, because by uh, differentiating uh, with respect to it, you can get the response to an external field. But in, the, in terms of what we're discussing, the interpretation as the most probable realization of the noise uh, is uh, most uh, natural. So even though in principle we have a Hamiltonian problem, a Lagrangian problem, I might as well skip all the details. I'll, I still want to uh, discuss them a bit because it will clarify a few things that I'll say later. So if we look at the equation, equations of motion, then we have uh, x hat dot is equal, and you know, if you don't see it immediately, then uh, you can work it out in a second, just by looking uh, at the Hamiltonian. So maybe I should copy the Hamiltonian. So it's uh, sitting, sorry, sitting in front of your eyes. Okay, so the Hamiltonian is here. This is the Hamiltonian, and we're just using Ham Hamilton's equations of motion. So we have x dot is equal uh, to mu kx dot. It's decoupled, actually, in this problem from x itself. And then we have x dot is equal to v of x plus 2 gamma x hat, which in this case is minus mu kx plus two gamma x hat. Okay, and again, if I look at this equation and I remember my original equation of motion, then again, I, I just realize that x hat is directly related uh, to the noise in the system. 
okay, so, so let me go ahead and, uh, and uh, skip a few lines of math. If you want, I'll go through it, through them. But solving, because X, we saw how it behaved in the Lagrangian so solution, but solving for X hat of T, the real realization of the noise, one finds that it's given by, this is the final position, and one finds that it essentially, as you might guess, it just grows exponentially towards uh, the final time, climbing up and pushing up uh, uh, a, a, the particle uh, uh, up. Okay, good. So, uh, so the, the next, any questions so far? Please, it's very hard for me, as I told you yesterday, to gauge if I'm clear or not without questions. I think it's clear. Okay. Hopefully. Okay. So, so now uh, I want, yeah. X cap was uh, eta, right? X hat yeah. is uh, related to the most probable realization of the noise. Okay, let's go through this again. This is our original equation of motion. Okay. Yeah. And if I isolate eta, this is how it looks. And if I look at x hat, then it's given also by this expression, which up to square root of n's and square root of two gamma is exactly the same thing. Yeah. So x hat is telling you how the noise the most probable realization of the noise behaves as you're making this uh, rare trajectory occur. So I, I just have the, the, the last sentence, you, uh, last line you wrote, x hat is a function of t, but x hat is also like eta, which is a noise. So, I mean, how, how do they sit together? I, I, I don't see that. So, so, so the trick in all this formalism is that we're, not looking at all the histories that lead to the final trajectory. We're looking at the most probable history. So, right, there are many, many realizations of the noise, but there's one realization whose probability is much, much larger than any other realization. Okay. And this is up to the factors of square root of n, etc. This is the re realization of this noise. Okay, so it's a specific realization of the noise, the most probable one. Okay. Okay, good. So now what I want to do is start exploiting the, the Hamiltonian structure of the problem, because as you know, Hamiltonians uh, carry a lot of analytical structure with them. So let's start by looking at the uh, 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 look, okay, sorry, look at a downhill trajectory. Okay, so in the downhill trajectory, the system is not using noise, so x hat is equal to zero. But remember for our part problem, and I'll write it explicitly again, just to be super clear. So the Hamiltonian is given by this guy, so the Hamiltonian in the downhill trajectory is zero, okay? And it's throughout the whole trajectory zero. Can, can somebody tell me why it's zero throughout the whole trajectory? Not because x hat is zero, what's the sort of slightly deeper, I wouldn't call it deeper, but uh, What's the reason that the Hamiltonian doesn't change along the trajectory? It's a deterministic path. Sorry? It's a deterministic path. Well, no, think, uh, think uh, mechanics. What's conserved? Think when... from high energy to low energy. Well, no, think about, this is a Hamiltonian problem. Hamiltonian is the energy of the system. When is the energy conserved? I mean, there is no noise, so dissipation, nothing is there, so. 
when there's no time dependence in the Hamiltonian, explicit time dependence, and our Hamiltonian has no time dependence. Okay? So the value of the Hamiltonian along a solution of the equations of motion has to be conserved. It's a constant of motion. Okay, you have, you have to switch on your uh, mechanics again. It's a Hamiltonian problem. You can think about it in terms of a mechanics problem. And, and the uh, Hamiltonian has to be conserved along the trajectory. Okay, so has since, let me write it down, since H does not depend explicitly on time, H of xx hat is conserved along a trajectory. Okay, here it is zero. Okay, now let me ask a question just to wake you up. Uh, what about the uphill? Uphill. What is the value of H? The value of the Hamiltonian at the final point? Sorry? Uh, um, maybe the value of the Hamiltonian at the final point? Well, let's, uh, let me give you a hint, okay? Have a look at this. Have a look at this and recall this is the form of the Hamiltonian. And we're going from, uh, it, we're going to a time TF goes to infinity. Okay, we're interested in TF goes to infinity. It so what happens? Be, be exciting. Sorry? It will be uh, uh, the potential on the VX. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, X hat runs along the... Uh, when we do... Okay, let me get to this question in a second. So if you look at X hat, then if I'm taking two if TF to infinity, then way back in the past, it was zero, right? So this means that at some point in the past, it was zero. And since the Hamiltonian is proportional to x hat, that means, and the Hamiltonian is conserved along the trajectory, that means that it has to also be zero for the uphill trajectory. So let's do this explicitly because you uh, uh, seem, uh, uh, it wasn't clear. So you can check this explicitly by taking the solution for the uphill uk tf minus t and the solution uh, for x which takes uh, this form tf minus t and if you plug it into the Hamiltonian explicitly uh, then okay okay let, let me at least write down the math xf squared e to the minus 2 mu k tf minus t plus mu k squared divided by gamma q. Talking to myself here. And that has to be zero because it's, it has to be zero because at a time, it, way back in the past, uh, x hat was equal to zero and the Hamiltonian is conserved along the trajectory. Okay, so we found out that uh, x the Hamiltonian corresponding to uh, a Tf for Tf goes to infinity has to be zero. Okay, so in other words, trajectories that are used to calculate steady state distributions have, have zero 
H or energy if you want. Okay, is this clear before I get to the question in the box? Sir, it's not clear like why TFS to be uh, very large, like why is this statement true only in the steady state? Right, this was the way that we obtained the steady state. We started at some point initially at time zero, and then we looked at what happens at, at very, very long times. If you would solve it for finite times, you find, which would not correspond to the steady state, you would find out that the energy is not zero. Okay, so by taking T, TF to infinity, we're ensuring that we're looking at configurations and the steady state. But in this calculation, uh, hx hat x equal to it's zero for all t f and t, right? No, so there's a boundary term in this case. So here I've actually, if you go back to what we did yesterday, there's a term that I throw out accounting to, to the fact that tf is very, very large. Okay, so, so if you would include that, you would find out that it's non-zero. Okay. So this solution is strictly okay only for TF going to infinity. Okay. Now there's a question that somebody remembered that X hat runs along the imaginary axis. But remember that we're doing a saddle point. And in the, when you do saddle point calculations, the saddle point doesn't have to sit on the axis that you're integrating and that's exactly what's happening here. Okay? Okay, good. Other questions? Okay, so, so, so let me ask this. They, let me just jump and, and run a bit forward. Okay, so just a recap, a short recap before I move forward. Recap, we had a Lagrangian formalism, we had a Hamiltonian formalism, and in both of them, the method for calculating the steady state probability distribution was solve, uh, solve the uh, equations of motion, find the trajectory, and then plug it into the action. One neat thing that I should say and I'll do something that you can't do if you're using handwritten notes. Uh, if you remember in the, if I look at this guy, let me copy it. If I look at this guy, which is what I want to evaluate, then actually if you do the math, then you don't have to worry if you're looking at steady state probability distributions, because the Hamiltonian is zero, all you have to actually do is calculate this integral with this guy. Okay, because for steady state distributions, the Hamiltonian is zero, and you're left with this simpler problem. Again, for the Hamiltonian case, you plug x hat as a function of time, and x dot as a function of time, and you get the action for downhill x hat is zero for uphill, uh, there's something else. Okay, questions before I go into slightly more uh, complicated scenarios. Okay, so, so the, next, the, the, the next sort of sub chapter is I'm going to discuss uh, consequences of the Hamiltonian structure. And once we're uh, done with that, then really uh, you have almost all the tools that you need uh, to calculate large deviations for specific uh, problems. I mean, up to technical problems. And, and I'm going to look at the, again, an equilibrium problem. We're going to discuss non-equilibrium problems, hopefully tomorrow, at least I'll sketch the behavior. 
and give you some uh, homework. So I'm going to look at a potential just to complicate things, which has two minima. So I'm going to look at a Brownian motion inside uh, a, a quadratic potential. So uh, what we have is that the potential, uh, if I draw it, V of X has uh, two uh, minima sitting at minus one in one. And if I drew them uh, correctly, then they would be of the same height. And the reason that I'm adding this slight complication is that uh, this will allow me to discuss something that I was asked about yesterday. What do you do when you have several metastable states? And uh, this will allow me to discuss these cases uh, also. Okay, and I'm going also going to set gamma from our equation of motion to be one half. And then uh, if, we, if you go through the math that I'll skip for a second, then you find out that V of X, which is the force acting on the particle, is X minus X cubed, just the derivative of the potential. And the Hamiltonian, which I'll leave for you to check, is X hat times X minus X cubed plus X hex square over two, okay? <clears throat> so we have equations of motion, which I can write down. I won't be solving any of those, plus X hat, which is the first Hamilton equation, and the second Hamilton equation is X hat times three X squared minus one, which is minus dH dx. Okay, and I'm going to discuss uh, uh, properties that emerge from the Hamiltonian problem for this simple potential, but everything I say is completely general. Okay, so let me start writing uh, the different properties. The first thing is the extrema of the potential. are in this case, in this case, x equals minus one, zero in one. So it's these three points. The external, external of the potential are fixed points of the dynamics. Okay? dynamics with x hat equal zero. Okay, so, so these are fixed points. You can check this by uh, inspection and I'm going to draw it in a second. If we look at these dynamics, when I set x hat to be zero, this is just the equation demanding that uh, you have an extrema of the potential and x hat, when x hat is zero, it doesn't change. X hat doesn't change with X hat is zero. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we see that uh, there are fixed points of the dynamics, the, the extrema of the potential. Okay, <clears throat> now uh, let, let me draw a picture in phase space, which I'm going to uh, use quite a bit. Uh, so hopefully I don't mess it up completely. Okay, that's life, it's going to be on, a bit on the side. So I'm going to plot phase space for this problem, which has the momenta and the position. And we have, when x hat is equal to zero, we have a fixed point at one, it's zero and minus one. And you can check, and it's not too surprising, that when we have noiseless dynamics, then this, uh, a maxima of the potential is an unstable fixed point, while these minima are stable fixed points. Okay, so it looks a bit complicated, but really all I'm saying is that if I am using noiseless dynamics, this is an attractive fixed point, and this is, this is an unrepellent fixed point or an unstable fixed point, 
that if you move away from it a bit, you just slide towards one of these fixed points. Okay, so this is uh, the noiseless dynamics uh, of the problem. Okay, now I'm going to be in trouble, but okay, that's slide. The second thing is, Liouville's, what, what does Liouville theory tell you about uh, a fixed point and phase space? Can somebody answer? Okay, I'm talking to myself. Some feedback, please. Okay, uh, there's a question in the box, uh, which could you postpone it until I finish this part? Just remind me if I forget to answer it because it's a bit off topic. Uh, so Liouville's theory, uh, yeah, there is an answer that area is preserved. There is what? No, there is an answer in the chat box that area is preserved. Okay, wonderful. I can't see it. Area is preserved. So this means that, uh, uh, so perfect, area is preserved. So this means that no purely attractive or, uh, or unstable fixed points. Okay, because if you have, for example, a purely attractive fixed point, then it means that phase space is contracting to this point. So that can't be. Okay, uh, so no purely attractive uh, or repulsive fixed point. So this means that each of these, uh, each of these fixed points has an unstable uh, direction. And I'm going to leave it as a small exercise to verify that what I'm drawing is in, indeed what happens. And hopefully I draw it without doing too much of a mess. So the curve looks generally like this. And because this fixed point, this fixed point is attractive in this direction, then it means that it's repulsive in this direction. And by, sorry, and uh, vice versa here. Okay, so every direction in every fixed point in phase space uh, has to be it has to have an attractive and repulsive uh, direction or unstable uh, direction. And what you see now is that we have these downhill trajectories which corresponds to moving without noise here. So, uh, so this implies that these guys, and I'll comment on it explicitly in a second, these guys are the uphill trajectories in phase space. Okay, questions about this? So uh, similarly, there is no purely repulsive attractive uh, fixed point meter, right? There's no purely repulsive? Yeah, so not only no purely attractive, but also. No purely repulsive, yes. Because that means that phase space is expanding. Yeah, yes, as okay. the origin is showing, yes. Okay, so, uh, so, uh, so these are the trajectories. And, uh, and uh, you see, again, I'm going to write it explicitly. Uh, uh, <clears throat> that we're interested in trajectories which correspond to uh, uh, to the steady state. So it takes an infinite amount of time uh, to reach them. And we argue, at least by one example, that that corresponds to trajectories going through x hat uh, equals zero. And all the other trajectories in phase space don't correspond, correspond to finite times. And you can sort of draw them uh, by uh, uh, sort of just con by extrapolating from what we have uh, at the moment here. 
So these, all these other trajectories in phase space, we're not going to be dealing with, uh, with those because they correspond to properties that are not related uh, to the steady state. So this is the uh, structure in phase space. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, is, uh, and if, okay, sorry, but it should be black. So if we want, I'm proceeding forward. If we want to start at a fixed point and end at another point, it takes, because we're starting at the fixed point, it takes an infinite amount of time of, sorry, of time to reach the point. Okay, so if you start at a fixed point, by definition, it's a fixed point. So if you want to mathematically start at an info in fixed point and take a limit where t goes to infinity, then it, you can leave it at an infinite amount of time, which is essentially the calculation that we did uh, for uh, the oscillator that I was looking before. So just to repeat what I'm trying to convey is that if you're interested in the steady state, uh, steady state configurations, which correspond to an infinite time, what we're really interested in is the dynamics starting from fixed points and leaving uh, towards some other points. Okay, uh, let me make one more, more uh, point for, uh, uh, we can formally, this will be useful for later, formally draw a graph between fixed points, points uh, and look and look at transition probabilities between them. Okay, so in this case, I could draw the fixed points, which are zero minus one, which I'll call one, zero, zero, which I'm going to call two, and zero, one, which I'm going to call three. So this is my three fixed points. Again, this is something that, just keep it in mind, I'm going to use it hopefully uh, uh, later today. And then I could uh, draw a graph where one goes to two, two goes to one, and two goes to three, and three goes to two. Okay, and this will answer the question about uh, metastable states uh, that I described above. Uh, again, I'm just repeating trajectories along x hat equals zero, have zero, not along, which, okay, sorry, which go through, which cross x hat equals zero, have zero energy. Okay, energy in the sense of the Hamiltonian, sort of answering uh, sort of answering the uh, question that's in the box, this Hamiltonian has nothing to do with the potential energy of the system. It describes the dynamics that I was discussing uh, above. Uh, and, uh, and <clears throat> okay, and since, uh, and just as a comment, uh, a, a, okay, let me make a point out of it and just repeat things a bit. So uh, dynamics 
with h of x hat x equals zero, uh, minimize the action and should be used for steady state calculations. Okay? One nice thing about this, if you look at the problem, we have the Hamiltonian is zero. So I'm just writing the Hamiltonian for the steady state. So it's zero. So that gives you a simple relation between uh, x hat and x along these trajectories, which exactly corresponds to this curve that I've drawn here. Okay, questions. The state one should be zero minus one. Uh, that's what I wrote, no? Oh. No, in the last bottom one. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that comment, yes. Other questions? Uh, what if the potential shape we are considering the, in the Hamiltonian, it is, what if it is not symmetric? Like what we are looking at right now. Everything applies. There's nothing special about this uh, symmetric potential. Okay, just to make things a bit easier. But again, everything I've said, one point, point one through uh, five, uh, hold exactly the same. Okay. okay, and actually, even if the problem is not in equilibrium. Uh, up to some more complicated structures that can emerge. This is, uh, uh, this is the most general, look, it, it, it might look scary, but all I'm doing is just using uh, the good old Hamiltonian dynamics, which we learn in, as undergraduate or graduates, and I apply it to this stochastic process. Okay, so everything I've done is just apply everything we know about Hamiltonian dynamics to, to this problem. Questions. I, I, I have a strange feeling, it might be because of Zoom, that I'm uh, talking to myself. So please ask questions. Regarding uh, point three. Yeah. So uh, I don't understand uh, quite much how a fixed point which is unstable classically, uh, a particle that starts there would stay for an infinite amount of time and not the opposite way around. Well, because if you really want to start at that point and tailor a solution that eventually leaves it, then the only way to do it is to uh, solve something uh, that takes an infinite amount of time. So, so again, if you want to clarify this, just uh, solve the... Uh, uh, let me think of a simple... Uh, you know, just solve this problem. I, I think it's probably doable. It's doable, actually. Okay? And, and you'll see that, because you, if you, you agree that formally, if I start at the fixed point, I can't leave it, right? Yes, uh, I mean, just intuitively, it would seem more probable that it would leave the fixed point immediately and stay at the attractive fixed point for an infinite amount of time. No, so what, what actually happens is you start, uh, you, if you really want to start at the fixed point, am I messing up something here? Let me think for a second. So all I'm saying, so let's imagine this, is that I start at this fixed point and I want to uh, find a trajectory, let's make it extreme, that I reach this point. Okay? So, uh, so am I missing something here? So 
So I think because at times t goes to minus infinity, I'm stuck at this location. Let's. I mean, it has to be a limiting process. Is it like you start epsilon away from? Yeah, that's exactly what I have in mind, that you want to do a limiting procedure where eventually you start on the fixed point. Uh, and, uh, and I think that if you do that, uh, if you do that, this limiting procedure, then, and if you want to take T to an, uh, if you want something that starts smack at time t, t equals to minus infinity, minus infinity on the fixed point, and you want to reach some point at time t, you see, think of, okay, let me try to convince you. Think about the point here. So the only trajectory that starts at t goes to minus infinity here and reaches time t at equal time zero. Once you've gone away from this point, then you slide very, very quickly. But once you slide here, then you run away to here. So the only solution that you'll have are ones that dwell here for a very, very long time. And just before they reach this point, they sort of glide down. Does that answer your question? Omer, I think, right? Yes, yeah, answers clearly. Okay, other questions? Uh, just for the mentor picture, if we have dynamics which start at minus one and ending at one maybe either the efforts shoot up to zero at the very beginning and then stay there almost infinite time and then at the end either also quickly relax to one is it okay so keep it keep that question for a few seconds okay. hopefully by the end of today i've taught you how to deal with uh, with this transition between one two and three okay okay Okay. But you're absolutely right that you have to consider the transition from here to here and then from here to here. Okay. okay. Hopefully today, uh, depending on how much, how many questions I have. Other questions? I think the direction, opposite direction. Could you clarify the question? I think the direction, you think that the direction, opposite direction, unstable and stable fixed points in this graph. So again, the x hat equal to zero. It just think about that as the noiseless dynamics. So that's just sliding along this potential. Okay, so this guy, if I started the maximum of the potential, let me draw the potential here. So if I start at the maximum of the potential, I slide here or here, these are these arrows. Okay? And because this is stable in this direction, then it has to be unstable in this direction, and the same holds for all the other fixed points. Other questions? If, if I start with um, a very, very small positive noise at x larger than one, then this, this whole picture, picture says that if I want to conserve the Hamiltonian, then the most probable path will take me to infinity eventually. No. Oh, you want to start? Start at a large x with a very, very small but positive x hat. Okay, let me sure. So you want uh, to do this or this. Yes. So th this would describe the dynamics of a particle that starts here with a bit of noise and does this crazy excursion up here. So that's yes. a trajectory that describes this crazy process. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just saying that say that you take uh, x equals 2 and x hat at, uh, equals plus epsilon. Okay? This means that if it will start going down towards the, the x equals 1 minimum. Look like that, this. Yeah. Okay, so we'll do something like this. 
and this is and this will be the the path that will keep the Hamiltonian fixed as meaning long, as long as you're looking at a finite time process remember infinite time processes cross x hat equal to zero but if you're interested in a finite time process this will be the solution okay <laughs> okay so all these guys the guys because i'm focusing on steady state i'm really interested in all these all these these trajectories all the other guys correspond to some crazy dynamics which occur over a finite uh, amount of time okay and it's a legitimate question to ask what happens there but it's not the focus of these lectures okay other questions one more before i go on Someone, even, even if you think that it's a really, really silly question, probably other people still didn't understand it. So in the end, it really looks like uh, it is helpful to think in an inverted potential. Now, now I see that if you start from the one of the fixed point, either minus one or one, then actually the transition will happen at the last moment. If you start to think about or problem in the inverted potential. Yes, if you want, you can think about it that way, yes. Or the uphill trend, tr 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 yes, yes. Or, also the question of Idan can be also answered in that way, like you climb up from the one, one of the this deep side, climb up a little bit, not a lot of energy, and then start to slide down to the infinity. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. so let me do a recap of how you do calculations. So, uh, so now, now assuming that I'm not talking to myself, uh, now have tools to evaluate uh, a, the large deviation function. Okay, and what I'm going to do uh, using a, a Lagrangian or Hamiltonian structure and what I'm going to do is I'm going to distinguish two cases the first we've discussed a lot so I'll go through it uh, very very quickly is when the dynamics have a single fixed point so when the dynamics has uh, a single fixed point, then, uh, then let me just do a drawing and not even do a, a calculation. I think that would be enough. Then in phase space, we have, this is the problem that we dealt with with the oscillator. We have a fixed point, say, sitting in this point. We have downhill trajectories hill trajectories along x hat equals zero. And then we'll have some uphill trajectories which cross x equals zero. And all you want to be, do is to find probability uh, to be at x, calculate equations of motion with solutions such that x of zero is equal to the fixed point, which I'm going to call x star, and and sorry, x at the final time uh, is equal to x with tf goes to infinity. And again, typically you take this to be minus infinity and this to be zero. Okay, and all you have to do to evaluate the large deviation function, all you have to do is do the integral 
from zero to infinity, say, of x hat x dot dt. And you're done. And here I've used the fact that the Hamiltonian is zero for these trajectories. Okay, any questions on this procedure? Because what I hope to be doing tomorrow is using it uh, to describe uh, some results that people have been obtaining uh, both for many body problems and hopefully also for active problems. Okay, questions? Okay, I have this eerie feeling. You see, I've asked, I'm asking for questions and the, the guys from my group are very generous, so they're asking me something, but somebody outside my group. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you one question. Okay. Yes. Can you, can you explain like one second, like why H is equal to zero? Like I understood from exact calculation that for the harmonic case, it turns out to be zero, but intuitively uh, for the forward path and reverse path, why would you expect H to be zero? For, again, if we look at the Hamiltonian, okay, if we look at the, general form of the Hamiltonian that we derived for these equations of motion. Okay, let me find it. Okay, then you see, and that, that is by construction always the case, that it's proportional to x hat. Okay? So that means that any downhill trajectory has to be zero by definition. Because x, x hat is equal to zero for those cases. For downhill trajectories. Okay. okay, now the uphill crosses x hat equals zero, and therefore it's also zero. There's- Sorry, for, for uphill, what did you say? The uphill crosses x hat equals to zero, right? Let's look at this figure that I drew here. The uphill is this guy, for example. So it okay. starts at the position where x hat is equal to zero. It climbs up, but because it started at x hat, x hat equal to zero, and the Hamiltonian oh, okay. doesn't have an explicit dependence on time, then the value of the Hamiltonian is always zero. Oh, okay. Now, if you want to relate it to something that you know much better than this, and just because I don't have much time, I've skipped it. If uh, the Hamiltonian is directly related to the lowest uh, eigenvalue of a Markov matrix, mm -hmm. which you know is always zero. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not so hard to do, but uh, it's, I've skipped it. Uh, I'm skipping it in these talks. But if you write down the Fokker Planck equation and you do an ansatz, the WKB ansatz, which e, e to the minus n phi, you find out that uh, the Hamiltonian is directly related to, to uh, in the steady state, directly related to the lowest eigenvalue of a Markov matrix. Okay. 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 Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Okay. So, what I want to do now, I want to look at uh, a slightly more complicated set settings where we have several uh, fixed points of the dynamics. Okay, and I, I think I'll close with that today. So again, I just want to think about this very- Yaris, very I, I have a question. So, yes. Hello. So on the lines of what Prashant asked, so can you go back to the that double, that phase space diagram? Please yes. Point? So, uh, if we, if we start from some, some, uh, so like for the uphill journey, so we are starting say at this minus one, uh, this, this fixed point mm -hmm. and to go uphill, you need the noise, right? Right. So there the, like, can, so the Hamiltonian is, I mean, should we say that it's, it's, uh, it does not have explicit time dependence. Yeah, because there's no. Right, it's a function of x hat and x. There's no time dependence in the Hamiltonian. It's, a, it's an implicit function, you know, like 
okay. p squared over 2m plus a potential that doesn't depend on time unless the potential depends on time explicitly. Okay. Okay? okay. Yeah. And again, the, the nice trick with this, is, which sort of is, it, is that because the Hamiltonian is zero, you, you can get this curve for free. It save, saves a lot of calculations. Because you have a simple relation, which is here between the, uh, the, this momentum variable and the x variables. So if you solve for one of them, you have the other for free. So what I want to do is I want to describe what do you do when you have three fixed points of the dynamics. Uh, and in, in particular, the problem is, which I was asked about yesterday, is, uh, is, uh, is that we need to calculate, need to evaluate the large deviation function at x1, at x2, and at x3. Okay, so uh, let's imagine for the moment that somebody imagine that someone gives you uh, phi of x1, etc. Okay, so somebody gives you the values at the fixed points. Then, if we want to calculate the probability of being at some arbitrary point, well, that's easy. We just want to minimize the action. So uh, in that case, to evaluate, sorry, to evaluate the probability of being at x, all you have to do is to minimize your action. So you run over all the fixed points. You take the value that somebody gave you for the large deviation at the fixed point, and then you calculate the action of going from the fixed point to the point that you're interested in. Okay, so this guy is cost of going from fixed point to uh, x. Okay, so that's the usual calculation that we did before. So really what I mean by this uh, seemingly complicated equation is that suppose that we want to know the probability of being here, then you evaluate the, you take phi of, uh, of being here, evaluate the action of doing this, then you do the action of doing this. In this case, we have to go through two, so we can ignore three. You compare both these uh, values and you take the minimal and you're done. Okay, so, so that's assuming that someone gives you uh, uh, phi of x1, phi of x2, and phi of x3. However, in general, sorry, so what are five, uh, like five the large deviation. This is the large, the value of the large deviation function at, at here, here, and here. So okay, e to the so power minus n phi is the probability to be at uh, x, yes. x alpha. Like exactly, that. thank you for the question. Okay, so let me repeat this again. We have this double potential and somebody gave me the probability of being here, the probability of being here, and the probability here. They're encoded in the value of the large deviation function at this point. And I want to know the probability of reaching this point, that what I do, I start at all the fixed points, and I look at the action starting from the fixed point to reach this point, and I choose the minimal cost, and that gives me the probability of being at the point X. Okay. Yeah, thank you. 
Okay, there was a question, is the Hamiltonian zero even if you're out of equilibrium? Yes, everything that we're doing is completely general even if the Hamiltonian is out of equilibrium. Okay, nothing changes. It's just a Langevin equation. The only thing that's hiding the fact that's in equilibrium is time reversal symmetry. And hopefully tomorrow I'll discuss cases when that's not the case. Some of them is homework and some I'll, I'll give as examples. Yeah, one, one final question about that last thing. So what happens to the trajectories where the energy is no, energies are not zero? I mean, so those correspond to finite time. They don't correspond to the steady state solution. Okay? okay. Okay. So, so, so that's what I was trying to say before it didn't came out uh, across that for steady state, we're interested in trajectories that take an infinite amount of time. And the only ones that take an infinite amount of time are those that cross these fixed points. All these okay. other guys correspond to finite time solutions. Okay, which you okay. can ask. Right, right. And, and people do these things, but that's not what I'm one thing at a time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I'm back to my uh, problem with several minima. And now what I want to do, the problem is, problem is we don't know, no uh, phi of x1, uh, phi of x2, and phi of x3. Okay, we don't know them a priori. <clears throat> so, what would you do? Help me. Suppose that you want to know the probability of being here. Just when you want to calculate a steady state, what do you verify? Steady state is independent of the starting point, no? That's true, but I want to calculate steady state probabilities for being here, here, and here. So suppose I want to evaluate the probability of being here. Let me help you a bit because I think I'm un not very clear. I want to evaluate the probability of being here uh, given that somebody gives me transition probabilities from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, and from here to here. So what do I do? Detail balance. Well, not detail balance, but I balance the fluxes. Okay? So to do this, what we do is balance fluxes. So let me write them uh, uh, explicitly. So, so what do I mean? Let me write down, let me look at the f example. Flux into and out of a point two. Okay, so we want the flux into point two. So we have the probability, and I'm writing things a bit a bit loose, but you'll see in a second where I'm heading with this. So we have the probability of, of so we have the flux in. The flux in is the probability of starting at x1, which is encoded in the large deviation function. And then you want the flux in, so you need the transition probability to reach t point two, at tf goes to infinity, assuming that I started at point at time zero at one. Okay, so this is, and let me draw it again so I don't have to scroll all the time. So we have one, two, and three. So this is, the flux from one to two. Then I have the flux from three to uh, two, which is given by, uh, again, x2, uh, tf goes to infinity, and then starting at x3 at time zero. Okay, so this is the flux in because of counted the probability of going from here to here, the probability of going from here to here. And this should be equal to the flux out. 
Okay, and the flux out is given by e to the minus n phi of x2 times, and I'll be a, a bit lazy here, the transition from x1 to x2. And the last one that I'm missing is what? Somebody? What am I missing here? Which S? So first of all, you should have shouted at me. What's, what's wrong in my equation? It should be x2 to x1, right? Okay, very good. So first mistake, x2 to x1. Okay, so this is the probability of starting at x2, and this guy with the n in front is the flux from two to one. So what's missing here? Flux to three. Two to three. Okay, two to three. Okay, so this is a balance, a flux balance equation. And now things become even simpler because, uh, because remember we're doing large deviations. So N is very, very large. So one of these guys completely dominates the other one. So what I can do, I can write down a much simpler equation, which is the minima over the fixed points, two, three, of phi of x alpha plus, let me write it explicitly just to be crystal clear here, is equal to the flux, to the maximal flux out. One, this is one and three, of S of X alpha infinity X two of zero. So just so I'm completely clear, this should be alpha equals one and three. So this is the, an equation. This is the equation, a closed equation for the probability to be at fixed points. Okay? Questions? So, but but uh, we don't know the actions, right? Or do we? Well, you have to calculate them. That's where things get hard. So, but the aim of writing these, uh, like, uh, we, we'll have three, this kind of equation for x1, x2, and x3. Right. And, and the aim is to compute, I think, e to the power minus n phi x1, uh, phi x alpha. Yeah, because once we know those, we can go back uh, to this equation and get it for any uh, value of x. Now, you're absolutely right that, you know, I, I never said that you're getting anything for free. You have to calculate this guy which is typically, a, can be a very hard calculation. Okay. okay? So there's no free okay. lunches. You have to work hard to, to solve these problems, especially if they're out of equilibrium. But I'm telling you, I'm giving you a prescription of exactly what you have uh, to do to obtain the full steady state distribution in the case that you have several fixed points. Okay. Okay, other questions? There's a hand raised by Ion. Oh, I think it was from before, sorry. Okay, other questions, because we have four minutes and I'm not going to start uh, something uh, 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 new. Hi, Yuri. Um, can yeah. I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, actually, I don't know if it's a question, a comment, a general statement, I don't know. Let's see how it comes out. Um, uh, as far as I can see, I mean, this is something that I was thinking now. Um, if we add some sort of uh, additive noise to the dynamics, 
to the noiseless dynamics, we make uh, uh, we make um, possible some trajectories that uh, couldn't be. Like for instance, if we were to start from uh, the fixed point, the stable fixed point I in the noiseless dynamic, only in the limit for d tends to infinity we would get to to three. Okay. Instead, if I add uh, some additive noise, this can be done in uh, some kind of time. Okay. In this this has to be somehow clarified. So, so, so again, let me repeat. The, this whole formalism is in the small noise limit. So, All right. so uh, if you're not in the small noise limit, you have to start evaluating contributions from other trajectories. Uh, these will be subleading in the sense if this is a large parameter. All right. Okay. That's okay. And, and you can do that in some cases. It's a slightly more elaborate calculation, but say, you know, it's essentially it's doing Gaussian fluctuations around the most prob probable history is the first correction. Now what this large parameter is, so for problems like this, it's typically, you know, the Kramer's problem, it's the height of the potential with respect to the temperature. Okay, um, I, I got this. Uh, the, the, the thing is that um, I, I just wanted to point out one, one thing here. If we had, even though it's, it's weak and it's, it's very small, uh, if, we, if we add it, we make a trajectory possible, uh, now possible that it wasn't before, like from one to three or vice versa. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay, um, I was thinking that if, if instead of putting, okay, and this may be, may go beyond to, to, to what uh, uh, we have done here with, uh, with the weak noise limit. But I was thinking if, if instead of putting an additive noise, we were to put a colored one. In, in that case, would, would we have, um, would, would it be allowed um, a contraction of the phase space? So a change of metric of the phase space. And so uh, somehow the fact that we put correlations uh, in the noise would, would not just accelerate or decelerate the process, but even change the metric of the phase space, and so somehow change the velocity of this of this process, even on a on a different uh, time scale. I don't know how to. to, to okay, so let me. Okay, it's a great question, and if I have time, I'll actually do an example like that tomorrow. Okay. 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 And Thank the trick you. in the case of colored noise, at least that uh, decays, the correlations decay exponentially, is to introduce another differential equation for the noise. And then you just add new variables into your problem. And then you can use the whole structure that we have here. All right, all right, okay. So in the end it would be, also in, the case, in, the, in that case it would be just accelerating or decelerating the process and we wouldn't see any change of metric in, this, in the phase space or there, there would be a change of metric. You could use the same formalism exactly. Okay. And uh, the calculations are, okay, look, uh, since you've asked, I'll, I'll probably start with this example tomorrow. Okay. okay Thank just you for fun, much, yeah. because it allows you to derive the Kramer's problem and something new for active particles. And I'll, uh, I'll start with that just for fun. Okay. Thank you, Yari. Yeah, thank you very much. So, so I have a, probably maybe Abhishek and Sanjeev could ask. There's a couple of things I could do tomorrow. I could focus more on escape problems and active processes. So I can mm -hmm. prepare probably uh, an hour and a half of that. Uh, I want to discuss a bit uh, breaking of time reversal symmetry. At least give a homework that illustrates this. Mm -hmm. uh, singularities. And then the question is, uh, how much do you guys want to hear also about macroscopic fluctuation theory? So I think this active would be probably better because I don't know this. It, there is a uh, I don't know, lecture on macroscopic fluctuation theory about I think two or three years back. I don't know any of the students who are present here. Can any of you confirm if you had a uh, hard this topic? Even if so, maybe this active thing would be better. Uh, yeah, I think so. Active, active thing. 
Yeah, I think his active is most popular nowadays. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so no, you can take a vote. <laughs> okay, so from the point of view, you see, you have, a, you have the technique. It's probably a bit too fast. You have to do a bit, uh, a few examples alone. But just doing simple oscillators is good enough uh, mm -hmm. before before you hit the research problem. And what I'll do tomorrow, I'll do uh, some active processes, and then I'll give you as homework. Uh, sort of uh, a, a, a problem where you can see the breaking of time reversal symmetry and one where you can see singularities because I, I like those a lot. I might even just discuss it in a very uh, qualitative way and not do any calculations. Uh, is, okay. is, is there anything you could do to, to say something about MFT, microscopy? Uh, the, 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 the. I could, but then, oh, okay. That, that depends <laughs> on the crowd. <laughs> I, I could introduce, uh, so let me try and come, I have three hours tomorrow, I'll take a break in the middle, but uh, let me try and do the active matter, uh, what I said, and if I have time at the end, at least I'll introduce what we mean by a macroscopic fluctuation theory and describe some of the results that have been obtained. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll try to achieve that, but I'm not sure I'll have enough time. So, Yarib, I have a question. So, if you have a potential with a very flat uh, bottom. Yes. Right? Uh, and then this, when you find out this part, uh, which takes infinite time. So, uh, so, so you have to be, I, 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 I'm not aware, maybe you guys know, but I think things become very messy when this is the case. Uh -huh. So here you are just assuming that it's quadratic at the bottom and the top, basically, right? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think that. What I, you have to have a minima. Well, uh, okay. No, you can have a minima, but let's say with a very high power of x. Uh, yeah. So you have to be. You see, if you don't have a, a quadratic near the bottom, I'd be worried that the Gaussian fluctuations around the most probable path would give you a, 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 an anomalously large contribution. Uh -huh. I'm not aware so much of, uh, let me try to think. I'm aware of the other problems of, uh, Yeah, I, I have to think about that. Okay. But I think I might, you, you might have to be at least careful there. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, uh, Yarek, I also had some uh, kind of comments or questions. Uh, so one was, I mean, uh, so like going from this Lagrangian to uh, Hamiltonian, I guess, uh, I mean, even without introducing this Martin Sigia, one can just think of it like uh, once I have the Lagrangian equations of motion, I can just yeah. think of doing the usual Lagrange transform and getting it the Hamiltonian description, right? Yeah, the only reason I did Martin Cheeser law is because it's something that's used a lot and it would be useful for people to see. But right, yeah, yeah. So, but it's a, one could have done it yeah. that way also, right? You, you okay. have it's an analytical mechanics problem and okay. just use everything you know. Okay, and uh, then, uh, so, uh, so we have this action uh, LDT and then once you go to the Hamiltonian, it becomes this PQ dot minus H. Uh, integral. Yeah. And then, I mean, again, what is the, so, uh, I mean, uh, this statement, uh, this h equal to zero, I mean, uh, how do you, uh, I mean, I, I still don't see so it completely generally. Like in this example, maybe uh, from the structure of h, it was kind of clear, but in general, I don't see it still completely. The, the structure of h is very, it always has, has you know, do the Martin Seizure laws or do the Lanzana transform. X hat always multiplies everything by the class of equations that we were looking at. Mm -hmm. Now, let me at least sketch, because I skip, I have notes on that, I skipped it. What you can do, let me just find it here. Okay, so what you can do is write down a, a focal Planck equation, and I'm just sketching it. So instead of using the format as I was doing, you write down the Fokker-Planck equation. 
and we have a plus one over n times the second derivative with respect to x of gamma times p. And you can make gamma dependent on space, doesn't matter at all. And you can make this for many variables, etc. And then you plug in uh, that the probability of observing x goes as e to the minus n times phi of x. Okay? And what we're interested is in the steady state solution of this guy, when this guy is zero. Okay? And when you demand this, you actually get the equation that h, and again, I'm skipping the math, that h of x and x dot, which is equal to x hat times v of x plus x hat squared times gamma, there must be a, might be a factor one half that I'm missing here, is actually equal to zero. So this is directly related to this uh, zero uh, eigenvalue of a Markov matrix. So, so all you have to do is take this guy, plug it into this equation, and keep the leading order in there. Okay? So it's just a matter of doing uh, math and keeping the leading order in it. So it's directly related to the st fact that we're looking at a steady state of a Markov matrix. I can't hear you. Uh, so this works, uh, I mean, uh, for any Markov process. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the things that become funny, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself for tomorrow. The things that become funny out of equilibrium, the first thing is that uphill is different than downhill, which is sort of you expect. This is how you calculate entropy production, right? That the difference between uh, path is different. So this is the first thing that you learn. I'll give a simple exercise wh where you can do it. And the, funny, the other funny thing that can happen in out of equilibrium systems that even if you put the system in a very smooth potential, then you can have cases where, where if you look at the trajectories in phase space, uh, you have uh, two trajectories that can actually uh, compete with each other. Uh, meaning, okay, I'll discuss it uh, later, uh, meaning that as you move in phase space, one becomes more probable than the other. And that leads to singularities, even if the underlying equations of motion are completely smooth, probability distributions can become singular. So these are the things that are funny in the out of equilibrium uh, setting in general. Uh, and then if you go to macroscopic location theory, then you have this fact that it's a non-local function. Okay. So, so these are, but, but everything I've said, I, I mean, I've done it in an equilibrium setting just to make things very, very clear from a calculational point of view, but everything, you know, you, you want to, you just write down your Langevin equation for whatever process you want, and you just use the formalism that I've described. And there's also generalizations for Poisson noise, but there's a neat way of getting the action that was derived by Giulio Biroli. And uh, Le Thore. Uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, Vivian Lecomte has some comments on that, but I've used it without problems. <laughs> okay, so again, nothing. Uh, the fact that I've done equilibrium is just to keep things simple, but everything holds for out of equilibrium systems. The whole formalism. Yeah. Alpha would be one and three in the flux balance equations. Alpha would be one and three. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, great. So now I know that somebody's... <laughs> somebody's... <laughs>